Okay. okay. I don't know whether I'll, I'll you, record. Maybe you want to eliminate some of it. I don't know. Because okay. I have a, a bunch of uh, these photographs here. This is my boot camp photographs. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Good buddy. <laughs> I'm at, um, Guam. And this is my buddy that we joined the Marine Corps together. Mm -hmm. Except he left about two weeks before I did, and he's dead. He survived the war, though. <clears throat> Pacific action. Mm -hmm. and these are some pictures of Guam, <clears throat> the old mm -hmm. graveyard. I was stationed at the Naval War College for a year, so that's what these pictures are. And there's some stuff about Iwo. And we end up with the signing of the declaration there. Mm -hmm. There was one particular one that I wanted to show you, and somehow I must have missed it. One that shows <clears throat> I thought there was another one besides this one, but anyway. This this was downtown Guam right after mm -hmm. the campaign. Anyway. That's that's all that was there. And over here. I have my original papers in 1943, where I had went in the Marine Corps. <laughs> and they assigned me the, the contingent that was going on a train with me, these other people. Oh, yeah. The very first day they gave me a job as a private. <laughs> There's my discharge. And <clears throat> this is a story about, about, uh, Going from Hawaii to to Guam, the campaign. I was aboard the HMS Slaughter Dyke for 50, 50 days in transit. Mm -hmm. We were the um, we were the reserve. 61st Replacement Battalion was the reserves for the Third Marine Division. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> and uh, the problem with that was that that. Um, 3rd Marine Division was also afloat for almost 50 days getting to Guam mm -hmm. because the 3rd Marine Division was the backup for Saipan and Tinian. Right. And <clears throat> so they kept us out there floating around too, <laughs> you know. <laughs> we ended up on that ship all that time. What, not a very pleasant experience. And I have some articles here in the, the leather neck and whatnot, but that's about it. Well, one thing we'd really like to get a hold of uh, to put in your file, which we don't have, is a picture of you from uh, World War II. A picture of me in World War II? Mm -hmm. Probably the ones that are in here, yeah. Yeah, we'd like to, uh, if there was some way, if you had an extra or one we could copy. Oh, you mean give you a, a, a picture? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I could do that. Something we can keep in the file? Yeah, I think so, because I have duplicates of some of this stuff. This is me all the way back in the first grade. <laughs> Take your pick. You can have any. Oh, your pick. <clears throat> well, I, I didn't know whether you wanted one over on Guam, or <clears throat> or do you want one in uniform over here? Uh, uh, preferably in the war, right? Over in 
Well, Guam would be nice, but I'd actually the, the biggest thing is, is something that's clearly recognizably you. Uh, you know, uh, I'd rather have a shot of you in, in your uh, uh, greens or, or blues than a combat shot if we can't make out who it is in the combat shot. Oh, you mean <clears throat> you'd rather have one of the, one like this? Well, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll give you that one. Oh, okay. You sure? Yeah, no problem. Right. You gotta add another stripe there. I made corporal fine. So we'll just take out, <laughs> well, take, take out my red and gold pen and just. Yeah, they're pretty cheap, you know. <laughs> in the Marine Corps, you don't get. You don't get. Uh, no, it takes time to make rank in the Marine Corps. You gotta put in your, all of your time before they give give you a promotion. <laughs> I even have. I even have my dog tags in here. <laughs> the, the old round ones, or do you have the uh, sort of oval ones? Yeah, I've brought all of my trivia <laughs> with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, the old, uh, the old Navy Marine Corps style, Mike. Yeah, they even have a brass pair. That was the first, first ones that I've had. Yeah, but yeah. I always second set. This was before they put the. The, oh, is that the blood type over here? Mm-hmm. Typo. Ar yeah, the Army does it a little differently. Uh, my, mine has a line uh, that said, uh, uh, blood, uh, for blood type, it says B positive. Mm -hmm. So whenever I was in uh, basic training or officer <laughs> I always called you B positive. Well, whenever I got depressed, I would just look at my blood type and say, B positive. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, the old color... Uh, Anchors, globe anchors. Yeah, that's that's the old brass ones. Oh, original. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, they have to face two different ways. That's right. Mm -hmm. Sharpshooter's badge, right? Yeah. What is this? What is this? Japanese? Uh... Well, that's a sh <laughs> shell, but I don't know where it's from. It could be one of our own. I just have a made a collection of it. And this looks like. <clears throat> Those are all boot camp medals. Uh -huh. See, typical army. I'm holding. I'm holding it like mine. Mm -hmm. Yours, yours goes like this. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, expert, huh? Well, I lived on a farm for a while, and we had uh, had a few guns around. <laughs> so I had a shotgun and a 22. So yeah, I was go. prepared when I went in the Marine Corps. Victory medal. Asiatic Pacific yeah. and uh, American uh, American. Theater. Yeah, they they didn't give me a medal for uh, <clears throat> for Guam though, and that bothered me. But what, I don't know when they when they figured the island is secure. I must have been a cutoff date. I didn't qualify or whatever. I, well, that happened a lot in the Pacific, uh, not only in the Central Pacific but in the Southwest Pacific. There was a lot of uh, uh, okay, the island secured. And of course, the fighting goes on for another two oh, weeks yes. or two months. Are you kidding? Yeah, right. I mean, Guam, Guam was where the, uh, the 1977, I think it was, where the last Japanese prisoner came out of right, the jungle. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I'll tell you as part of my story that <clears throat> that uh, the war was over three months after, and in November, we were out trying to track down some Japs because they were invading some of the camps and trying yeah. to steal food and whatnot, you know? And so we were out on patrol, and I said, those bastards don't know the war's over. And here I am with a 610 on my back. It was a damn heavy radio, radio you know. And they're going to get me before I leave here. But they didn't. Good. Yeah, <laughs> so we want to right. hear about that. <laughs> well, why don't we get started? Mike, right. are we set up right? Yep. Anytime. Good? I don't know. Okay. Did you want this up or down? That's fine. Well, it could, it could be down. I don't care. Okay, interview with Mr. Joseph G. Guerin on 28 February 2001 at the Ronkonkoma Flight Facility, Long Island, New York. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Von Hassel. Videographer is Mr. Michael Akey. Uh, Mr. Guerin, tell me about where and when you were born. I was born in North Braddock, Pennsylvania, <clears throat> 1523. Okay, and uh, did you grow up there? Yes, I grew up there. Until I was in third grade, I guess it was.
was. And then where, what happened? <clears throat> no, first grade. I'm sorry, first grade. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to uh, a farm, 37-acre farm, between Murraysville and Monroeville. In New York? <clears throat> in, no, in Pennsylvania. Still in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Okay. okay. And, uh, and I enlisted in the Marine Corps. Did you want to go to that step? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Listed in the Marine Corps in February of 1943. Mm -hmm. What caused you to enlist in the Marine Corps? Why the Marine Corps? <clears throat> well, I actually tried for the Air Corps first. <laughs> and that was in October, I think, of the previous year. And my buddy Jim Barron and I, who was my neighbor, we both went in at the same time. And we took some tests and whatnot, and I guess we got washed out. So. After that, we both got frustrated and decided we go in the Marine Corps. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know really, I can't remember really why we decided the Marine Corps, but maybe we liked the uniform or something, I don't know. Maybe we were both just gung-ho. Okay. So. And so tell me about your initial experiences when, when you got in the Marine Corps. <clears throat> well, I, I went to boot camp at Paris Island in February of 1943 and did my six weeks of uh, boot camp training there. After that, I got a furlough transfer from Paris Island to <clears throat> Newport, Rhode, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. On the way, I had stopped home for a week or so and then went on to Newport, okay? <clears throat> At Newport, I joined the uh, Marine Detachment, Newport, and we did some guard duty work at the uh, torpedo station that no longer exists there now mm -hmm. <clears throat> for several months. And then I was transferred to the Naval War College for a year, roughly a year. And that was real good duty. Why? Yeah, I liked it. <laughs> we, we had good facilities and uh, <clears throat> we... Uh, that was called the Naval Training Station, NTS. Good facilities there and good people to work with. Well, and of course, we were, we were, we were uh, <clears throat> hobnobbing with all of the admirals and whatnot in the war room and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it, it really involved just guard duty as far as I was concerned, you know. Yeah. What kind of things were going on? At, uh, I thought the Naval War College closed during the war. Oh, no, it was wide open. <laughs> oh, yeah. So they, they had, were still training officers out oh, there? Oh, yeah. yeah. They had all sorts of activity. They had a war room and everything, you know, mm -hmm. you know, showing where all the ships were. And uh, a lot of admirals, I guess a lot of them were retired, hanging out there. Mm -hmm. And we went through a uh, fire training school there, too, where how to, how to put fires out aboard ship. And... Um, it was a small detachment. I think there may be 25 people at the most, something like that. <clears throat> and we would be right at the entrance door, checking badges and whatnot, people coming in. And then <clears throat> we had tours of, of, uh, that went on all night long of the whole building. Mm -hmm. yeah, we had a time clock we had to carry and go around to every floor and check in with the time clock so they knew that they was taken care of. Right? So, just a routine sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But it saved my butt going overseas too soon. <laughs> like my friend Jim went right over into the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hung out in, in Newport for about a year. Uh, after that, <clears throat> I was transferred to um, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina and underwent, I think, about two more weeks of uh, training there, field activity, things like that. And then, <clears throat> and then we were shipped up to uh, Norfolk. In Norfolk, we got aboard the uh, USS Baxter, which was a cargo ship, really, but it was used to transport personnel. And we left Norfolk and went south with the destroyer escort just ahead of us to Panama. <clears throat> of 
course, we didn't know where the hell we were going. <laughs> I don't tell you anything, as you probably know. So once we left the shoreline and there was no more land around, I wondered, what the hell am I doing out here, you know? <laughs> Everything I want is back there. I suddenly realized that I'm now really in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. It's not just fun and games, you know? So uh, anyway, on our way down to uh, Cologne, which is the port on the uh, eastern end of uh, Panama, uh, apparently the, the destroyer escort must have <clears throat> must have been suspicious about some German submarines in the area because they occasionally dropped some ash cans off of the boat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> off the ship, I shouldn't say boat. And, um, <clears throat> but we never got into any trouble. The uh, boat itself, or the ship itself, uh, <clears throat> stopped running a few times. I think we were on its maiden voyage, so everything wasn't working just right. Either that or they didn't want to have any noise mm. for the submarine to pick up, I'm not sure. So at, at Cologne, we, uh, <clears throat> we just tied up there for a few hours, waiting for a tour through the canal. And uh, we went up through the canal and then on to Hawaii. And at Hawaii, we joined the, uh, the 61st Replacement Battalion. And that was, that was in Honolulu. And I think I was there two to three weeks, something like that. <clears throat> and we were kind of lucky while we were there because Bob Hope had his show in Hawaii when we were there. Oh. It's really amazed. What was that like? Fantastic. Did, did a very nice job. So then we, then we went aboard the... Um, HMS Slaughterdyke. The HMS Slaughterdyke <clears throat> was a Dutch ship. It was. Uh, it had a Dutch captain. It had. It was in in command of the army. It was hauling Marines. It had a few uh, Navy guys on the guns. They had a few small guns aboard ship. So. Uh, I don't really know who the hell was in charge. <laughs> but the HMS Slaughterdyke was an old veteran. And um, it had seen its day. It was kind of rusty and whatnot. And 800 of us went aboard, according to my notes here. <clears throat> And I say it was a Dutch twin screw cargo vessel converted to a troop transport, appropriately, it na appropriately named the HMS Slaughterdyke. A veteran of many ocean voyages in need of repair and painting. She performed well, performed well in the national emergency, however. The pounding diesels could churn up the brine and the propeller at top speed <coughs> of uh, 24 knots. A somewhat rare combination of personnel were aboard, as I explained earlier. The captain was a Dutch part of the crew, command of the Army. The chaplain and medical staff are Navy, and a few on the guns, any aircraft, and merchant marine deckhands. And they were hauling Marines. Well, that was quite, uh, quite a combination. <laughs> yes. So where did the uh, transport take you to? I'm getting to that. <laughs> okay. Um, the vast expanse of the blue-green Pacific waters lay ahead of us gave us no clue of our destination. Uh, as Hawaii faded away on the western horizon, numerous forecasting rumors spread like wildfire, creating a sense of insecurity. Days went by as we followed the zigzag course of a destroyer escort piloting and standing ready to protect us against any enemy aggression. Small groups of men engaged in various diversion on top of the hatch covers or under the lifeboats. Card games went on of all sorts every day. Some wrote letters and other read pocket-sized mystery books. An easy way to wash clothes was to, we discovered, was to make fast the clothes to a sturdy line and drop them over the fantail 
into the ship's wake. The churning wake would serve as a giant washboard for the clothes as they dragged through it by the ship's motion. After 12 days, we reached the Marshall Islands and anchored in the middle of this chain that was formed by a protective barrier reef surrounding us. <clears throat> 35 days we stayed here on this crowded transport. Discontent was growing <clears throat> more irritable every day. Since we were only 10 degrees north of the equator, we suffered from tropical heat and the flash rainstorms. <clears throat> Swimming was permitted over the side of the ship. A cargo net was facilitated the means of getting back aboard. Two meals a day were served if you cared to eat ox tongue and boiled potatoes prepared in various disguises. We had so much ox tongue that I can't recall having any other variety of food. The troops were breaking out in rashes from the poor diet. There was fear of an epidemic because aggravated by the tropical climate, <clears throat> sleeping below deck was almost impossible. It was too hot and stuffy, so almost everybody slept topside and every night it rained, so we got, rent, so we got wet. During the last week of the Marshall Islands, we heard a news broadcast that the 3rd Marine Division struck in force at Guam. Then we were informed that, that our lot was held in reserve for this attack. By the end of the week, we were headed for full speed for Guam. This time, it was five days unescorted to our destination. Our ship anchored offshore, and we were put aboard landing barges hence deposited on the coral beach of this Marianas, Marianas Island. <clears throat> After 52 days aboard the HMS Slaughter Dyke, we were glad to be on dry land, even though it was an overgrown jungle that was still a war to fight. <laughs> I, I might add that um, I wrote this when I was going to college here at Hofstra in one of my English classes, and that's why I have this particular record. <laughs> How long ago was that? That was uh, a few years after the war was over. Yeah. Okay, so now, once you, uh, you didn't go in on the assault waves before. No, no, no. I was, we were, we were the, uh, we were the reserves for, for the uh, Third Marine Division. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> I think I have someplace in the file here the date that we arrived, but it was probably several weeks after, even after the campaign, the initial part of the campaign was over, we, we arrived. And <clears throat> I was assigned to uh, what was called then an s, s company, supply and salvage. And what we did is we went out <clears throat> with a truck and brought back ammunition that the Japs had left in caves and stockpiled here and there and stuff like that. And uh, we were under fire some of that time, too, because those Japs were still hanging out out there, you know. They didn't want us disturbing their loot. What so, did you do with the Japanese ammunition once you got it? We, we brought it back to what they called an ammo dump. And once, once when we just made our deposit, there was, a, <clears throat> there was a white smoke coming up right out of the middle of the, <laughs> of the dump. And all of us ran like hell in that direction. And one guy who knew what he was doing ran the other way and took care of the problem. But it was, it was probably a um, what do you call these these things they use for flares? Phosphorus. Right? Yeah, phosphorus, a phosphorus uh, thing that let go. Mm -hmm. But I was only with that group a short time, and then I was I was transferred to the. 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines, we replaced some of the guys that got whacked during the campaign. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, I was transferred to the 3rd Marine um, <clears throat> Battalion, 3rd Marine and 3rd Division. Same division, but the 3rd Marine so Battalion. You went to the 3rd Battalion of the 3rd Marine? Right, right. Mm -hmm. And during that time, <clears throat> I, um, I was in headquarters company, 
and my tent, I have a picture of it in here, <clears throat> has, um, we were, we were, another fellow, and I felt a fellow by the name of Conley from, from Boston. This is the inside of my tent right here. And that's me sitting on my, right at my desk that I made. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> he, he and this other fellow, Connolly, and I were responsible for maintaining two 10 kW generators. And we had all of the telephone equipment, all of, all of the switchboards, and all of the radios and everything else were in this double tent that we, uh, we had. So we had a pretty good setup there. We thought better than uh, just a canvas sack, you know, under a tent with no, no deck under it. So. <clears throat> I was in that particular group until until I left Guam mm -hmm. and, and came home. Because from Guam, we went to Iwo Jima, and I was aboard the USS Callaway, which was a Coast Guard ship. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a relatively small ship. I don't know the size of it, but it <clears throat> was no big big uh, troop carrier, you know, it was a small Coast Guard boat. And we were the, <clears throat> our particular battalion were the reserve battalion for the invasion of Iwo Jima. The uh, 4th Marine Division and the 5th Marine Division and the 3rd Marine Division, parts of the 3rd Marine Division, invaded Iwo Jima. On our way to Iwo, <clears throat> Um, one of the, one of the, um, I couldn't call them cyclones, what do they call those? Typhoons? Uh, typhoons, yeah, acted up, and <clears throat> our little boat was 30 feet underwater, <laughs> you know, the bow would go underwater, the screws would come up out of the water, and, uh, but we made it. And as a matter of fact, the same storm kind of battered Iwo for the invasion of Iwo Jima because they were having a lot of trouble with landing craft trying to get ashore and stuff like that. So we pulled up within, it seems to me like it was like we were like a mile offshore, dropped anchor right there, mm -hmm. very, very close to shore. There were battleships directly behind us and cruisers on both sides and they were <clears throat> blasting away at Mount Sarabachi and up in the center part of the island, <clears throat> those divisions had already landed by the time we got there. We were probably there D plus just a few days, four or five days after the initial landing. And again, we were the reserved uh, contingent mm -hmm. to back up the third ring division there. <clears throat> and uh, I don't think that anybody really thought that the Japanese would be so well fortified at that island that it would take so long to, to take it, take possession of it. And <clears throat> although they were well prepared with three divisions to, to attack it, the Japanese had like 25,000 troops there. And they were there long enough to dig a lot of trenches and caves and tunnels and whatnot. And, uh, <clears throat> and so they were well entrenched with heavy artillery and, and rockets and you name it, they had it. So it was a very, very tough fight, but we happened to be what you might call the grandstand seat. We were aboard ship and we could see all of this activity going on just a mile away, bombs dropping and Japanese even had some sort of a, uh, <clears throat> a rocket thing that looked like an ash can. As a matter of fact, that's what they called it, a garbage can. <laughs> Every once in a while you see one come from the north to the south and explode. So we were there watching this whole thing, had our packs on twice as I remember, ready to go over the side, and never did. Mm. Instead of that, what we did was we had, they had a number of casualties that came aboard our ship and we sailed back to Guam while the campaign was still, still going on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Now, I read in, in some of the some of the texts and magazine articles and books and whatnot that there was a big 
argument between Howland Mad Smith, who was our commander, and Erskine, who was the general in charge, about whether or not we should land. And uh, <clears throat> Erskine said he felt that they had enough people on the island. They didn't need to expose us to this. And so, and Smith was determined he was going to get us off that boat. <laughs> But he lost, mm -hmm. so we came back. Fortunately, we had a couple of burials at sea of the people that did not survive, the ones that we had taken on on board, and uh, <clears throat> came right back to Guam. Uh, the campaign went on for for Guam for Iwo Jima went on for more than 35 days, as I recall it. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and we were already back at, at Guam when it was, they were only like halfway down the, the island. The island was only seven miles long, too. It wasn't very long. It was only two miles wide. But uh, they were so well dug in and entrenched that uh, you had to blast them out of every foot of it. So <clears throat> you might say that I lucked out both on Guam and Iwo Jima because we were both the reserve group and we didn't have to really do battle. So what happened after you got back to Pearl Harbor? Well, <clears throat> we didn't go back to Pearl Harbor. We went from, we went from Iwo back to Guam. Back to Guam. Back okay. to Guam. That's where our, 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 <clears throat> our whole contingent, our whole division came back after the campaign for Guam came back. Right. Uh, or rather back to Iwo, from Iwo back to Guam. And we, <clears throat> what we did after that was some more field exercises, and we were we were getting prepared. Matter of fact, our sea bags and everything were packed, ready to uh, hit the mainland of Japan, because Iwo was only 600 miles south of Tokyo, and the main reason for attacking Iwo was that it had an airport there, <clears throat> two airports, as a matter of fact. And the B-29s that were bombing Japan were running into trouble if aircraft uh, guns damaged them or whatnot. They're mm -hmm. looking for a place to come down, and, and uh, they had to also avoid Iwo on the way up and coming back. So that was the main reason for knocking Iwo out of the out of the combat zone. So we came. <clears throat> so uh, we were we were we were already packed, ready to go to uh, hit the mainland and. Sea bags and all, board, you know. And then they dropped the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. So I think it was three strikes for me. Because <laughs> with the atomic bomb, that ended the war as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. My partner that, was, that shared the tent with me went on to Japan. I had enough points by then to come home. So I finally got home in uh, February of uh, uh, 45. Yeah, 46, 46, 46, yeah, 46. Yeah, the bomb was dropped in 45 in August, but we st still were on Guam almost six months later mm -hmm. until January. <clears throat> um, I came home on the USS Bunker Hill, which is a aircraft carrier, mm -hmm. and that was a pleasant ride. Of course, I knew I was going home. <laughs> that was number one. But this huge, huge aircraft had great accommodations on it. And the Pacific was really Pacific. It was flat as a pancake, like a lake, all the way back to San Diego. So uh, it was a good ride home. And knowing you're going that way instead of the other way made it all the better. <laughs> So we arrived in San Diego, <clears throat> and then I was, I went by train from San Diego to Great Lakes, and was discharged from Great Lakes back to Pittsburgh. And then <clears throat> only a few months later, um, we sold our property in Pennsylvania, and my parents and I moved to New York. I had two sisters that lived in New York, and that's the main reason we came here. But one other thing I should mention is that 
The day that I got home from the Marine Corps that night, the preceding morning, my brother joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> so I missed him by about eight hours. I didn't even know he was going in the Marine Corps. But he must have, must have thought the adventure would have been nice. The war is over, you know, it must be great. I'll have to try this. So he did. And he went through Paris Island and, <clears throat> and was an expert rifleman and was, was in contest in Hawaii and ended up in China and came home after three years and it was, it was a good duty for him. So, so what, uh, what, did, what became of you after the war? Did you? Well, af after the war was over, <clears throat> I came back. I, before the war started, I worked for Carnegie Illinois Steel in Duquesne. I operated a 45-ton overhead electric crane in the open hearth furnace area. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when I came home, my job was waiting for me, of course. <laughs> They promised veterans you get your job back. So I went back there, and I knew I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. But I did that for a few months, and in May of that year, I got out in February, May of that year we moved to New York, and I went to work for the Long Island Lighting Company there. And with my experience of telephone and power uh, in the Marine Corps, and I took some courses, uh, electrical courses, while I was, in the, while I was <coughs> on Guam, um, I was hired as a planner mm -hmm. in, the, at, in the Long Island Company. <clears throat> and I came to the company at, at the right time because there was a lot of construction going on on the island. Everybody needed a house. Mm. A, lot of marine, a lot of people were getting discharged, so they needed a place to live. And Levitt was building zillions of houses there. <clears throat> So I grew with the department over a period of 37 years and ended up as the assistant department manager of that department. I was responsible for some 200 people, engineers, planners, clerks, and whatnot. So it was a very interesting, uh, very interesting job because we designed both the gas and electric distribution systems for the entire 1,230 square miles of Long Island. Very, very interesting. And uh, family? Did you get married? Yes, I got married in 1952, and I have uh, two daughters and a son. <clears throat> my son is the youngest. Both of my daughters, <clears throat> all three of them got college educations, <clears throat> and uh, my oldest daughter married a guy who graduated from the Coast Guard Academy, mm -hmm. and they have twin daughters who are right now attending Rensselaer Polytech in Troy, New York. Mm. <clears throat> um, they're very bright students and uh, doing very well the first year. Good. They, one of them wants to be a physicist because her dad works for Brookhaven National Lab. And <clears throat> she got very much involved in physics and, and graduated salutatorian in her class of 360. And the other one <clears throat> wants to be, I think, maybe uh, computer science or something like that. She, 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 liked, she did well in math, but she didn't want to make that, do that the rest of her life like somebody in physics was going to do, you know. <laughs> so... That's where they are. My uh, other daughter married um, a lawyer, and we have two grandsons with them. Twin girls here, two boys over here, but they're not twins. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's hold here for a moment because we're going to have to change tapes. Okay. Back to. Told them knock it off. Okay, tape two, interview with Mr. Joseph Guerin on uh, 28th February. Mr. Guerin, uh, we had left out one of your sons, but we ran out of tape before one you of our One of my children. I only have one son. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. okay. <clears throat> His name happens to be Craig. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> uh, Craig graduated from Lehigh University and then went to work for AT&T. <clears throat> His major was um, 
integrated circuits. So at AT&T at Bell Labs, he, he designed the architecture for computer chips. <clears throat> and part of the program then was um, they would send you away for your master's degree at their expense, which he was very fortunate to go on. So he, he picked Stan he could go anywhere he wanted. He would pick Stanford and uh, got his master's degree from Stanford. And we came back to uh, Bell Labs after his degree and, and um, was tied into the manufacturing facility in Bethpage, in uh, Bethlehem. Actually, it was in Allentown, two communities right next door to each other. <coughs> and he married a girl from, that happened to be a nurse in Bethlehem when he was going to college there and settled down in Allentown and they have a boy and a girl. So they're the only ones with one of each. <laughs> and I think they're all done, all three of them. <laughs> well, let's go back and, and uh, uh, get some questions on some particular items. Uh, one, what was it like going through boot camp at Paris Island? Tough, really tough. How so? Oh, well, <clears throat> the drill instructors are unmerciful. They are just, it's part of the training, I'm sure. You know, they, they want to make sure what they say, jump, you're going to jump. <laughs> and they were terrible. They would get you up at 2 o'clock in the morning and you'd be outside exercising. They would blame it on somebody doing something, but it wasn't that at all. Uh, they would just get you up and let you know they're in charge. Well, what did you make of that? I mean, you had volunteered for the Marines. <laughs> did you ever have any doubts? Well, frankly, I didn't know anything about the Marine Corps before I joined it. And uh, I was a country boy, really. I worked in the city, but I was a country boy. And um, <clears throat> on the forum, we didn't have a... Well, we did have a radio, but that was it, you know, back, I'm talking back in 1940. And we had outdoor plumbing, and also the water was outdoors. You had to walk 50 yards or so to the well. And, uh, but it was, it was a very interesting life. I was used to the tough life on, you know, working on a farm and whatnot. So I could... I could probably handle the Marine Corps boot camp better than some city kid. You remember city kids having a problem with it? Well, sure. There's some guys that didn't make it, you know. Did, did so. you ever get a hard time from anybody about being uh, from the Northeast? or? No. no. Not at all. Any particular incidents stand out in your mind now about... In boot camp? Yeah. <clears throat> No, just the long marches and the uh, that time of the year, these no see You know what no see are? What are they? Well, they're tiny little bugs, you know, that fly around like fleas. And you're standing at attention, and they're up your nose and in your ears and everywhere, up your nostrils. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> we just, <clears throat> you know, I would, I would never want to live down that way. As a matter of fact, as a result of being on Guam for some 18 months, I would never want to live in that climate. We were like 12 degrees above the equator on Guam. Very humid, you know, we're mosquito netting all the time in, in, your, in, in bed at night, stuff like that, forget about it. So that's why I stayed in New York and not migrated to Florida, because I retired 17 years ago. And uh, <laughs> I said, I, I want my four seasons. Matter of fact, I skied until maybe 10 years ago. I finally gave that up. <clears throat> How did you feel at the end of basic or boot camp? Did you feel confident? Uh... Oh, yeah. I, I think so. I think it instilled a lot of discipline and confidence in me, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. You felt like you were prepared for what you might have to face? Uh, th I think that I really didn't know any better. You know, if I if I knew that the war was really hell the way it really is, uh, I would not have felt that confident. Did they tell you a lot about Marine Corps history? Or oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. give, try to give you a sense of what it was to be a Marine. Oh yeah, sure. 
Yeah, you know, it's all gung ho. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did that help uh, prepare you, or did that make you feel well, more confident? Well, I, I, I'm sure that it, it helped some. Yes, I, I think you <clears throat> you felt a little bit a more superior than somebody in the army. Well, I shouldn't say that in front of you, but <laughs> but anyway. No, that was part of their tra training. Yeah. Yeah. If you can, remember what, what kind of, what did it mean to you at the time to be a Marine? What did you feel like you were part of? Uh, well, I, I felt proud to be part of the, uh, part of the Corps, actually. Mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> and I still do. I'm a life member of the Marine Corps League. Did they tell you what the, you know, what the traditions of the Corps were? Or? Yes, you learned a lot of the history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you give me an idea of some of that? Well, you know, <laughs> the uh, <clears throat> the Marine Corps goes all the way back to, I don't know the date, and at this age, I'm 78 years old now, so I'm not all that great about dates, except mm -hmm. it's strange. I can remember <clears throat> a lot of specifics about the three years that I was in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. But ask me what happened five years after that, and I couldn't tell you. <laughs> you know, when I was a, when I was a civilian, I couldn't tell you the detail now, that I can that about this. I guess it really instilled uh, uh, a lot of um, maybe fear in me being in the, in, the, in the service and being under fire and whatnot. It's. Uh, it just, uh, it's an experience that I was very glad that I had, but I wouldn't do it again if they paid me a million dollars, you know. Just didn't know any better. Now let's jump ahead. Tell me about that Bob Hope show you saw in uh, Well, Hawaii. Bob, you know, Bob one? Hope <clears throat> and his entourage uh, did this all over the Pacific. They, as a matter of fact, he went to Vietnam and Everywhere there was a war going on, he put on his show. He'd have a little girly show and whatnot, and that was just a uh, pick-me-up, pick you know, to raise the morale of the troops, show somebody who was interested in, you know, what you're doing over there. As a matter of fact, somebody else, some other famous um, comedian or somebody came to Guam when we were on Guam. I can't remember who it was, but anyway, it was another one of these shows, USO shows or whatever, you yeah. know. On Guam, we had outdoor movies and stuff like that, too. Were you able to actually see Bob Hope, or were you sitting oh, yes. way out in the No, in the no, we were, I was fairly close, yeah, it's fairly close. Mm -hmm. we, <clears throat> there, weren't, there weren't all that many people on Hawaii at the time. You know, there's a tra it was a transient center, so it was, you were in and out. But I was very happy to see him. Now, uh, you mentioned you'd gone to Hofstra after the war? Yes. Mm -hmm. Was that on the GI Bill? Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah. What did you study? I was <clears throat> pre-engineering. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's, that's how I ended up. Actually, it was an was add-on to my other courses that I took when I was in the Marine Corps. And it was all, <clears throat> it was all basically electricity. Mm -hmm. Did you finish at Hofstra? No, I didn't finish. I got married and had a couple of kids. Oh. <laughs> I was going to school at night. Hofstra yeah. was a lot smaller then. Oh, then. much smaller, yeah. Much, much smaller. We, we had some of our sessions were in Quonset huts. Reminded me of being down at down to Paris Island. <laughs> was there a big influx of veterans at that time? Oh, sure. Well, most of them were veterans, sure. Mm -hmm. and, and the Quonset huts, were they set up for the veterans? Yeah. They were set up for, you mean at, at Hofstra? Yeah. It was classrooms, yeah. Classrooms and quonset huts. Yeah, they had some quonset huts here for classrooms, huh? Yeah. <clears throat> now, of course, you said you had a grandstand uh, view of uh, the Battle of Iwo Jima. Absolutely, yeah. And did you see the flag raising go up on Sorbachi? Yeah, I don't, I don't recall seeing that. <clears throat> uh, I don't know exactly when that flag was raised. I know they had a tough time getting up to Sarah Batchy, but I don't know how many days afterwards. But um, I don't recall seeing the flag. It may have been something that I saw, but didn't make, pay me much attention to. I don't really know. Didn't make all of the history that it did afterwards, you know. Mm -hmm. So I probably did see it, but... Uh, yeah. 
What other impressions did you have of Iwo Jima from uh, your grandstand view? Well, <clears throat> um, actually, it was horrendous. When, when you saw the, uh, the casualties come back to the boat, back to our ship, and you saw how they were all entrenched right on the beach. They couldn't even get off the beach at Iwo for days. <clears throat> and you saw the tremendous amount of, of um, naval gunfire going on there, you know. They were blasting almost continuously, these eight-inch shells hitting Mount Sarabachi and out in the middle of the, middle of the airport and then gradually working their way up up the coast, and you saw these rockets that, that uh, <clears throat> the Marines had rocket launchers right on the beach and it sent up like a hundred of them at a time, you know, blasting away trying to clear a specific area. It was uh, it's very moving. Well, you must have had some kind of uh, trepidation. Uh, oh, absolutely. Watching yeah. all this. Oh, well, absolutely. Wondering when you're going to get the call to go. Yeah. But there was nothing you could do about it, you know. So you figured, well, my time to go, it's my time to go, I'm going to go. <laughs> yeah, I was very happy I didn't have to go, but uh, then again, <clears throat> uh, I felt sorry for the people that didn't make it. The real heroes are the ones that were buried there. I just went along for the ride, so to speak. <laughs> now, on the way back, there were burials at sea? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, the ship's companies was assembled for the burial service? Yes, we had it right off the fantail, right? <clears throat> they Well, <clears throat> they wrapped the corpse in, in, uh, in the canvas and put them on a plank <clears throat> and just they had a little prayer or whatever, the chaplain, and then shoved them out to sea. They had, I think they had bricks on the bottom of the uh, thing to sink the, the slab. Do you remember what you were thinking or feeling at the time while you were watching it? Well, I was certainly feeling <clears throat> sorry for that guy, you know, and grateful that I wasn't one of those. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> now, let's see, the, the people on Guam, the, the native population, Chamorros? Yeah, they were they're essentially called gooks, but they were Chamorros, you know, people, that was their name. Right? What were they like? Well, they were <clears throat> they were uh, distant. They, you know, we didn't talk to them at all. There was no no one on one contact with any of them. Mm -hmm. Anytime you saw them, you know the. And it's it's funny on Guam. I guess it is in in, the, in those islands. The women walk ahead of the men. I guess <laughs> I guess maybe that's so the man can get away in case somebody wants to capture his wife. <laughs> But it was funny. Uh, <clears throat> they they were, they went through one terrible hardship under the Japanese, and then they took a terrible beating with uh, all the artillery and whatnot during the campaign. Mm -hmm. So they were all kind of stunned, you know, after uh, all that activity. Guam collapsed two days after uh, the attack on Hawaii. And the Japanese took them over. So they, there wasn't an awful lot of damage done when the Japs took over. But I think they were mistreated a lot by the Japs. And then we came ashore. It took them a while to get accustomed to, you know, dealing with, with the Marines. But I'm sure we had a much better rapport with them because we had been on the island for many years before that. Mm -hmm. But wasn't Guam the first Marine Corps station or base that had been captured by the Japanese that we took back? Exactly, right after Hawaii, two days right. after. Mm -hmm. and it was the first one that we actually recaptured from the Japanese. No, no, it was, uh, well, you mean one that we owned? Yes. It was a United States possession before, yes. Yes. yes you're right, yeah. We didn't take The other back. islands were, were Tarawa and, and Guadalcanal and Which Bougainville. Been, yeah, that had either been... Japanese mandates or, or not. Yeah, we were Filipinos. Yeah. The first one that we had actually been in possession of that Most they well, took. Yeah, well. right. And um, the Marines that the Marines that came to the Third Marine Division came from Bougainville to Guam. Those are the ones that we were the reserves for. Right. 
Now, would you say that your time in the service changed your life or the life of your family? Well, <clears throat> I think maybe it gave me a better appreciation of life and uh, the experience of being with other people and seeing a lot of the different parts of the world was a, a positive experience, I think, except for you know, the campaign itself. Mm -hmm. So that part of it was a plus. Do you think your life would have gone differently if you hadn't been in the service? Uh, <clears throat> probably would have. You know, I think that uh, I really don't know what would become of me because it really it was really in the Marine Corps that I got interested in telephone and power. And that changed my whole career path afterwards from just being you know, a crane operator to ultimately engineering. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that probably also changed the path of the lives of your children, too. Absolutely. Yeah. But when you first moved to Long Island, where did you live? <clears throat> we lived uh, in Mastic. Mastic Beach, as a matter of fact. My sister lived in Mastic Beach, and we moved there, and then my parents, my brother-in-law and I built a house for my parents, and it was after that was built that I went to work for the Long Island Company, kind of in between there, looking for a job, mm -hmm. you know. And then after, after I started working for the company, I started in Bay Shore, New York, and stayed there ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got married. We live in Brightwaters, which is right next door, mm -hmm. and then, and have, have living in the same house for the last 46 years or so. You know, got married in '52. Now, look back on your time in, in the service in the Marines in the war. Anything that uh, particularly uh, stands out or summarizes it all for you? Well, the thing that really sticks out is my ride home on the aircraft carrier, because it was a happy day. <laughs> I knew I was coming home, and I knew the war was over, mm -hmm. and it was a good ride, and uh, I met a lot of different people aboard ship there, people that I hadn't met, you know, while on Guam and whatever, because I don't know how many people this thing had on it, but probably had 3,000 you know, Marines on it coming home. It's a huge, huge aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. So that, that was really the standout. The only other standout really was, was the attack of, of Iwo Jima. That was terrible. And uh, <clears throat> the Guam thing, that was kind of hit and miss. You know, you had some skirmishes here and there, but uh, the, the big part of the battle was over, and Guam was in no comparison to Iwo, because on Guam, I think we lost 1,600 Marines, and on Iwo, we lost 6,000. Mm -hmm. Any uh, last final thoughts? I think. Any final thoughts before we conclude? Well, I appreciate the opportunity of, of uh, sitting with you two gentlemen and, and presenting my story, and I hope that other people have an interest in it. And as I mentioned, while you were out of the room, I hope I get a copy of this. So, <laughs> so that Mike, any questions? So what did you think of Holland Smith? Well, all we heard about him was that he was a real tough hombre, you know, and he wanted everything his way. And he would, he would, um, he was a, really a Marine general. I mean, this guy was tough as nails. And if he wanted you to take that mountain or that hill, you're going to do it. <laughs> Did you have any interaction with Army troops? Yes, we we um, we had. Um, I can't remember the the number, but after the <clears throat> after the initial landing of the Third uh, Marine Division on Guam, there was an army contingent that came ashore. Uh, I don't re recall the, the name of the, the outfit, though, but they were there aboard. And we also, I also was, uh, became friendly with some Seabees 
that were building the, the airport uh, on, on Guam because they got beat up a bit during the attack. So there's some nice people in the Seabees that I got to talk to. Did you get along with the Army? Oh, yes. Guys? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, of course, we thought we were better than them, but when that, didn't <laughs> that was instilled in us in, in boot camp. So. Can you talk about Saipan? Uh, the only thing I know about Saipan is that my buddy, <clears throat> who um, was my neighbor, joined the Marine Corps with me. He happened to end up in the 4th Marine Division, and he landed on Saipan. <clears throat> and he got wounded on Saipan and got back to Hawaii, and he ended up back at Iwo Jima <laughs> with the 4th Marine Division the <laughs> second time around, and went ashore also. Yeah. Saipan was a very... Uh, Saipan and Tinian uh, took a long time to conquer, and that's why we were aboard ship for 50 days because the Third Marine Division was the reserve group for the Saipan Tinian invasion, and they weren't sure they were going to make it. They, made, they almost had to put the Third Marine Division in there to, to as the reserve troops to uh, knock them off. But was there any comments on the Army's uh, role in Saipan? I really don't know. Okay. No, I don't really know. I have any idea. But okay. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>